Welcome to another episode of This Too Shall Suck podcast, where we talk about the real of grief, the whole grief, and nothing but the grief. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. (laughs) Welcome back to another episode, guys. I am your host, Lauren Denise, and I am so ecstatic to have you here. If this is your first time here, welcome. Thank you so much for listening. Um, If you are listening again, welcome back to the squad. And thank you so much for continuing to join me on this journey. On today's episode, we're going to dive into something I know all too well. Um, It is perfectionism. And so I I thought about this, how I wanted to handle it, because I thought about talking about it from a perspective of, you know, what perfectionism is and how you can kind of combat it. Um, So I do want to talk about that. And then I want to talk about in relation to grief and how it can cause a grief within grieving and then how to overcome that and what that looks like. And so, again, this is something that I personally deal with. So I feel like that. I'm vulnerable and I'm honest and open and transparent. That's why you guys are still here listening on every episode. But like, I really want to get, um, you know, vulnerable today with you all, because again, this is something that I personally deal with, um, on a daily basis, honestly. And it's something that I had to work through in therapy. And so I thought it was really important to talk about because I actually had an incident happen, I'll say within the past month with my perfectionism, I'll just say complex. I don't want to say like issue, but you know, with my perfectionism, that kind of caused me to react instead of respond. Um, because those are two different things. You can definitely respond to something and then you can react to something. And so, uh, with my perfectionism, a lot of times I react and I'm learning how to respond as opposed to react. So I wanted to talk about that and get into that. Um, So let's just talk about what the definition of perfectionism is. So the Google definition (laughs) of perfectionism, and and this is just kind of in psychology, in the realm of psychology, not in like a Webster's Dictionary. So in psychology, it is a broad personality style characterized by a person's concern with striving for flawlessness and perfection perfection and is accompanied by critical self-evaluations and concerns regarding others' evaluations. I know that was a mouthful. (laughs) So basically, it's just saying it's a personality trait of a a human being who is trying to strive perfection, right? Trying to strive the the this level or this peak of greatness or this peak of life or peak of whatever it is that is happening um, based on you know, their own self-evaluate critical, I'll say super like hypercritical self-evaluation or the um, evaluation of others. And so they strive to create this life or create this thing or look a certain type of way in order to, um, to basically just make their life easier and make, make their life like, okay, I'm good. Right. And so um, a, a question that came up that I thought was interesting that someone had asked when talking about perfectionism if someone asks, is it a mental illness? And it it is not a mental illness. And although it can cause certain things, so uh, perfectionism is more of a personality trait, um, but it can cause like um, depression. It can cause anxiety, you know, which are all, you know, mental illnesses. It can, um, you can actually have traits of, um, what is it? Obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, which it... <laughs> So people tell me I do have a little bit of OCD in me, which whatever, fine, I do. You know, there's certain way of doing things or if you've ever been to any event that I've been to, like, yes, I do have um, a little bit of OCD inside of me. So having that personality trait can, you can have symptoms of OCD. And again, it can cause those mental illnesses like depression, anxiety. It can actually cause um, eating disorders and some people actually self-harm themselves because of it. And so if you think about um, people who are, what is it, bulimic? Is that when you throw up your food? I believe that's what it is. Um, you know, um, they have this this complex inside of them that, oh my God, I have to be a certain type of weight or I'm not going to be desirable or I'm not going to be pretty or whatever. Same thing 
you know, with anorexia or things like that. And I'm not saying that's the case. I'm not saying that's the reason why. What I'm saying is it can cause those disorders. Having perfectionism can cause those disorders. And in some cases, you know, my even mild cases, they can actually interfere with your quality of life. It can um, interfere with your personal relationships. It can interfere with your education or even work. Because if you're striving again for this level that's not there, it can interfere with the things that you're doing on a bit daily basis because you're constantly striving for something and you're looking for either a certain type of validation or you're looking for a certain um, way of looking and it's just never going to happen. And so it can start interfering with who you are in the relationships that you have. So, um, you know, I'll share my story a little bit with perfectionism and how I really even found out what it was or where it came from. And it was, you know, through therapy, of course. Um, but it like, once I found out like, oh, you have this personality trait of per, uh, perfectionism, like I was able to recognize it and able to, um, like I said, respond instead of react. And I was able to handle certain situations better now that I know that's the personality trait that I have. And so I want to talk about some pros of per- perfectionism because, you know, of course it's like, oh, she's a perfectionist, you know, and, um, It has a very negative connotation to it, but some pros to it actually are that it motivates you to give your best and achieve your goals and it encourages self-improvement. Okay. So, you know, again, I think it does have a negative connotation and, and it can cause a lot of things in your life to not be the most positive. Right. Um, but it does give you the grind and the motivation to do things. I will say that now, now knowing that personality trait, now I understand why I hustle the way that I do, or I grind the way that I do, or like, I'm like, nope, I can be doing better. I can be, you know, dive, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? (laughs) Climbing higher than what I am is because I have that personality trait inside of me. Um, but of course, again, you know, with the good and the bad, I just want to talk about how it can cause grief. So that's the pros of it, right? Like it's definitely going to motivate you to do your best. It's going to motivate you to achieve your goals. You're going to definitely constantly be looking at yourself like, how can I do better? Um, But it can actually cause a grief, right? So if you're grieving and you have a level of perfect and you have that personality trait of perfectionism, it can actually cause a grief within a grief. And woo, when I tell you that's a doozy. Um, so like some of the cons basically of um, perfectionism, like I said, is causing some of those mental illnesses such as depression or anxiety, you know, eating disorders, things like that. Um, But basically it's, and I'm reading this from an article. um, It says many people often fall into the downside of the trait, the the personality trait of perfectionism. The downside is setting up standards that are extremely high, rigid, or impossible to achieve. This ideal sets a person up for failure, disappointment, and negative self-evaluations. And so imagine that, guys. So you you set these bars so high for yourself and you're like, you know what? I'm going to be VP by the time I'm 30 and then 30 comes and you're not the VP or, oh, I'm going to have like a house, a kid, you know, house, kids, husband by the age of 25. First of all, let's talk about that. Let's just put a pin in that. Why did like I know I'm not the only one out here listening. Why did we ever think that was appropriate? Like, girl, like some people can do that. But girl. Like now being age 33 and like thinking about where I was at 25, ma'am, you were not ready to have nobody's child, be anybody's wife, okay, or have anyone's home, right? (laughs) So I don't even know why ever. You know what it was? It was those mash games when we were younger. Mm -hmm. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know what I'm talking about when you had to mash and then you had, oh, husband by this age. See, that's what it was. This We were setting ourselves up for failure a long time ago. That's what it was. It was not my fault. It's these children's games. Are <laughs> just, I'm playing slick, but low key. Um, but um, so think about that. So like you are, you know, striving for these these goals and you you don't meet them. Right. And so now you're depressed. Now you're sad. Now you're, you know, in all of these things. And you're like, oh, my God, like 
you know, again, that's a grief in itself. All of these feelings of like, why in the world, like, can I not get to where I'm going? And you're just like moving through the day and you're not understanding and you're trying. And it's just like, my God, and you're not even realizing it's because you're setting these almost unrealistic or super high expectations for yourself. And then when you don't meet them, you get disappointed or you're just like, oh my God, like you got to do better. You are garbage. You know, you start talking crazy to yourself, you know, so that's a grief all in itself. And then while you are grieving, like say, like you are grieving, whatever it is. So the grief is right. Like say you, 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 um, don't get promoted. That's a grief in itself. And now you have another grief because you didn't get promoted. And oh my God, I'm such a failure. How can I have not got promoted? So now you got a grief inside of a grief. And that is a whole nother nuance that you now have to deal with. So it's absolutely crazy guys. And it's absolutely something that, um, is really hard to deal with. And I'm, and again, I'm just sharing with you from my perspective, because I am a person who struggles with the, um, the trait of perfectionism. And so it it really is hard for me. And so I read a couple articles that I think will help understanding perfectionism and help understanding creating like a grief inside of a grief and what grieving in the, I'll say the connection between grieving and perfectionism. So, um, I wanted to read the first article because it really aligned with who I, well, I have some notes from it. It really aligned with me and it really stuck out to me because it was essentially my story. Um, and I was like, oh my God, like this, th- yes, Lauren, this is you. And um, recognizing again, those moments of perfectionism inside of the grief that I was already having created another grief inside of myself that I didn't even recognize until I went to therapy. And so in this particular article, um, it was by a pastor's wife. Her name was Ashley. And the article was titled Perfectionism and Grief. Um, And so I I thought it was interesting to name it that because, you know, well, I'll get into the reason why, but the other article kind of counteracts it. And at first when I read the second article, I'm like, what is she talking about? But then after reading this article and understanding the, the levels and the layers, I'm like, oh, I get it now. Um, So again, this was by uh, a pastor's wife. Her name was Ashley. Um, And so basically, you know, she was used to the eyes being on her. She's used to being a pastor's wife and being out there and seen. And, you know, I, I don't, I can imagine like being number one, a pastor, like everybody freaked out. (laughs) It's not funny, but everybody freaked out about the whole Kirk Franklin thing. Like what? He cursed. Yes, Christians curse. I am a Christian. Y'all have heard me curse a couple of good times on here, you know, but we're not perfect. People are just not perfect. People who love God are not perfect. People who are Muslim are not perfect. Nobody is like perfect. Right. So, um, again, you know, but she basically was saying like, I'm used to the eyes being on me. I'm used to people looking at me a certain type of way. I'm used to being the first lady and, you know, like, oh my God, she just so, you know, she was used to kind of that spotlight. So I just wanted to make sure to highlight that because I think it'll make sense for the rest of the story. And so um, essentially what happened is her grief was she was pregnant and she had lost her child um, to a miscarriage or, you know, she didn't really go into detail, but basically just, she just said she lost her baby. Um, and, you know, she wanted to open up um, really as quickly as possible about Um, her story or their story on losing their child, because she said that, you know, they wanted to give God glory and, you know, give him room to be amplified and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so she realized when she opened up about that story, you know, she started writing blog posts and just being like super, super transparent about her grief. Um, you know, she started getting people reaching out to her, of course. Right. I mean, you know, same here. Like I'm in a place, obviously I'm being open and transparent about my grief. And so people start reaching out, um, and, and asking questions, right. Cause it kind of positions you to be a quote unquote grief expert. And that is what happened to her, right. Is that, you know, as she became more, Uh, visible about this story, you know, women started reaching out to her, you know, who were like, Oh my God, I was in your shoes. I completely understand. How did you do this? Blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, and you know, as they became more familiar, they just started approaching her and started looking at her as this grief expert. And then they started, um, 
almost placing an expectation on her. But see, let's talk about that. So that is that spirit of, I don't know what you call it, spirit, that sounds crazy. That trait of perfectionism, right? Is that when people start doing these things or people start reaching out or, you know, people start looking at you a certain type of way or coming to your advice, you start putting expectations on yourself because you have put yourself in these shoes or you have put these things in your mind, right? Nobody came to her and said, you know what, because you are open about your story with grief, I expect you to know exactly what to say. I expect you to know what to, to discuss in this moment. I expect that you are able to comfort me when I am going through, right? Nobody said those things to her, but when you have that personality trait of perfection, now you start putting those expectations on yourself based upon actions of other people, which goes back to the, essentially the um, definition or the psychological definition of what perfectionism is. And so um, she said that basically, you know, when she became this grief expert, she started placing these uh, expectations upon herself. And so she felt that every time she was talking to a woman going through this journey, that she needed to have the perfect words to say, she needed to have to perfect books that, you know, when you lose a child, what to go through and that she had to have this perfect path, um, to, to like at the end of the conversation, right? She needed to set the, she said, quote unquote, I need to set women on the perfect path to grieving, which is absolutely crazy, which will uh, link that to the second article that I read. Um, so just keep that in mind when I say she wanted to set women on the perfect path to grieving, um, because at the end of the day, there is no perfect way to grieve. That's just like, boom, we can end the episode right there. Like there's no perfect way to grieve. There's no, like I said, there's no right and wrong way to grieve. There's good and bad ways that you can grieve, but there's no perfect way because everyone's grief is unique to them. And grief is just so many, if y'all haven't learned anything by now, rocking with me, what's this? We 19 episodes in at this point that grief is a unique journey and grief is going to be what it's going to be for everybody. Then I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing something right, you know, but you know, it, it was crazy again, that personality trait of perfectionism that she felt she needed to set women on the perfect path to grieving. Um, so, you know, shortly after that, she shared that she had lost yet another baby. Right. Um, so not only have, are you still grieving the loss of this first child? You put yourself in this position as a a, um, a grief expert because people are coming to you and you put these expectations on yourself that, okay, I need to make sure that I'm saying the right things to them when they're coming to me. I need to make sure I have the perfect books. I need to make sure I have all the articles. I need to make sure that when they leave, they know exactly where to go with their grief, right? So you have the grief of losing your child. You now have this grief of trying to meet this expectation of being the perfect griever um, of, of losing a child. And now you have this other grief of now losing your second child. When I tell you, my God, my father, Lord have mercy. Um, and so like in that moment, she created again, another grief based off of her perfectionism because now she's lost her second baby. And so now because she has put these expectations on herself, she felt the pressure to what's the word that she used to grieve well. Right. And to set an example that, you know what, like you can go through this and you can grieve well, like you don't have to be on the floor crying and screaming. You don't have to be laid out. You don't have to be depressed. You can push through this grief. Right. And that was, <laughs> again, you created, what is that? One, two, three, that's four griefs now that you created in the midst of just this one grief of losing your child. My God, my father, again, like, geez, listen, I, look, I'm clearly triggered, um, you know, but again, perfectionism, it's, it's wild. Perfectionism can cause a grief and perfectionism can cause a grief inside of a grief inside of a grief inside of a grief. Um, and so she recognized that, like she started realizing she was kind of giving out um, generic or um, not generic. What's the word I'm looking for? Like calculated responses. Right. When people were coming to uh, coming to her, you know, when they're like, oh, my God, how are you doing? And, you know, it's like, you know what? I'm doing well. The Lord is blessed and highly favored, you know, and I've been there. Right. Like if anyone is listening, like any of my friends, they know I've been there. I'm like, oh, it's fine. It's good. 
And I really may be like struggling hardcore, but you know, I'm the grief girl, right? So I, I don't want to, you know, show that it's, it's, you know, rough today or that today wasn't a great day. But as I've learned and understood what perfectionism is and how it can affect you, now I am able to say, you know what, today was a, a garbage day. Um, you know, I really struggled. I got frustrated you know, or I really was missing my parents or, you know, I wish I was working in corporate, you know, just certain things that I'm going through. Like now I understand how important it is to be vulnerable and to be honest um, because she felt that, you know, when she realized like, oh, I'm kind of giving these like calculated responses, you know, that she just wanted to give off the right impression and that, you know, I'm processing my grief well and, in the back of her mind or in her heart, she is struggling. Right. And then she realized like looking like that, that doesn't like, I'm not being as genuine and vulnerable as I can. And ha am I really helping these people by not being genuine and vulnerable? Right. Because if I was being genuine and vulnerable, then I would be able to help people more to say, you know what? Like, she's not perfect. Like she's a first lady. She's in the light and she's lost two babies and she is struggling. Like she struggles to get out of bed every day and she struggles and she goes through the same things that I go through as someone who's not in the spotlight. Right. And so I thought that was really important for her to recognize in that moment is that, you know what, like something's not right here. Um, you know, she, it was, it was one of those things she said, um, she said a quote, um, that basically once she started realizing like she was giving calculated responses that if I let them know today was hard, will they assume I wasn't trusting God? Am I talking too much about loss? Am I talking too little about it? So she started going through all of these things in her head, which is the same thing that happened with me as well. And again, I'll kind of get into my story in a second. Um, but you know, it's like, okay, am I doing too much? Am I doing too little? But you know, I don't want them to know that like today wasn't a good day because like, are they going to think that, oh, well, how are you talking about it when you're still having bad days? You know what I mean? Um, but basically in her attempt to quote unquote, grieve perfectly, like I said, she wasn't being vulnerable. She wasn't being genuine. And so she had to figure out like, okay, how can I really help people and be genuine and be vulnerable and not strive for this perfectionism, right? And so she said she had a breakthrough. You know, one day she was just sitting at home and really had a breakthrough. And she recognized that her perfectionism of grief stemmed from fear. And that's the thing about perfectionism. It stems from somewhere all the time. And I'll talk about that when we go through the ways of coping with it. It always stems from something. Like you don't, you're, well, let me not say you're not born a perfectionist because I don't really know the nuances of that. But what I will say is that nine times out of 10, your perfectionism is stemmed from something. It, whether it's fear, whether it's guilt, whether it's rejection, whether it's whatever, it always uh, stems from something. And so she recognized in that moment that her grief stemmed from fear, right? And her perfectionism of trying to like be the perfect griever stemmed from that. And it stemmed from the fear that she was to blame for the loss of her children. And so, you know, she felt guilty or she was like, oh my gosh, like, is this something that I did that I lost these babies and I wasn't able to like, you know, give my husband the family that he deserved. Right. And so now it's like, oh, that's why I'm trying to like be the perfect griever because I don't want to be honest and vulnerable to say, you know what? It might've been my fault. Even though in the back of her mind, she knew it wasn't her fault. She knew at the end of the day, you know, sometimes these things just happen. It wasn't like she threw herself down the stairs or anything. Crazy, you know what I mean? Like it just happens sometimes to women. And, um, you know, she, she knew that in the back of her mind, she knew it was not her fault, but that fear overtook her so much that it created this, um, complex of professionalism inside of her that she felt like she had to grieve perfectly because she didn't want to be vulnerable and show that side of her. And so, you know, what is, is crazy about this whole story? Um, you know, she, at, well, at the end of the story, she essentially got to the point of like, you know what, like, let me be open and honest. And she started being more open and honest and vulnerable and sharing like really what she was going through and that she wasn't perfect. And she didn't always know what to say when people were, you know, going through that or, um, you know, she felt guilty about losing, you know, she, she was very honest and open and transparent about what she was going through. And of course that helped so many more women when she was doing that, instead of just being, you know, Miss Patty perfect at the coffee shop, when people are coming, she was being way more open, way more honest. And she, you know, helped 
hundreds of women um, who were going through that. So it was it was a wonderful story. But something that I recognize at the end of this story is that grief isn't perfect. It's progress, right? Grief isn't perfect. It's never going to be perfect. And it's always a, a process. And so you know, the, I really thought that was a great story to talk about because the second article that I read um, was about, well, it was titled, I'll say it was titled Perfectionism and Grief Cannot Coexist. And again, before reading the the story that I read before, this was the first story and I read and I was like, girl, what? Yes, I can. They're like, but what she said is if you're grieving, you cannot hold yourself to being perfect, which is absolutely true. And that goes back to my point that grieving is not perfect. It's process because at the end of the day, like there's number one, no perfect way to grieve. And number two, like Ashley was doing in that story, she was reaching or trying to, to, or putting this expectation on herself of being the perfect griever. And there's just no way you can do that because grief is not perfect. It's never going to be perfect. Like you, you can't grieve perfectly. Like, I don't even know if there's a, like, what does that even look like? Like type in like Google perfect grief. And like, what, what does that even mean? Like, oh, well, you know what? Perfect grief is, you know, being, upset for seven days and then three days later I'm good like what what is, like what? <laughs> I had to laugh at myself on that one like what does that even look like there is no such thing and so like my story with that kind of aligns with like Ashley's um so with this whole podcast right um I've kind of set myself And put myself in a position to be, as I always say, a self-proclaimed grief expert, right? And so when people call me, a lot of people call me now about, you know, grief, obviously, I always am striving to find the thing to say that's perfect or to show that, you know what, like these are the good parts of grief and not necessarily show the bad parts. But I will say that um, I have been way more I think, I think that I have been more open and vulnerable and that is, and that's why I wanted to create this podcast because I wanted to be open and vulnerable about it to show that there are bad days. And if you follow me on social media, I talk about that. Like sometimes there's bad days. Like I didn't go to uh, my parents' um, gravesite for a long time because I didn't want to acknowledge the fact that they were gone. So I chose to live in a state of denial. Do <laughs> you know what I mean? Like whether it was a year, whether it was six months, I chose to live in a state of denial, but, um, going through the, the process of grief, I had to understand, I had to let go of the loss of it. And I was able to, uh, go visit them recently and be at peace about it. I, I wasn't crying crazy. I wasn't, you know, my chest wasn't tightening up, which usually happens. Like I was just able to talk to them and I was at such a piece about it. Right. But that is something that I typically wouldn't share to say like, oh, I'm not going to my parents' grave site for a year because I'm in denial. But like, those are the things I need to share. Like, listen, I couldn't do it. Like, and there's a lot of people out there the same way. Like I know people who are like, I'm not going to the grave site. Like, you know, like, and that's fine. That is totally fine and it is your world and you will do what you need to do, right? But that was something that I struggled with when people were coming to me about their grief, whatever it was, whether it was losing. And most of the time people do come to me about losing somebody, but you know, it's different for everybody because my relationship with my mom and dad may be different than your relationship with whoever it is that you lost or your relationship with your ex-husband or ex-wife or losing a job or, you know, uh, whatever, insert whatever the loss is, it's different. And so sometimes I don't have the the perfect thing to say because it may not have been a loss that I experienced but I can say hey this is what happened in my grief and my loss and this is what I can share right as opposed to saying okay well you lost your job tell me about that you know like it's it's just being like hey listen I I don't know what that experience is like I'm so sorry that that's happened to you um I I don't know what that experience is like for because I've never experienced that, but I'm here to listen. I'm here to try and work through it with you and let's work through it together. That's all I can give at that point. Right. And that's what people need sometimes. And that's okay. Or sometimes people know like, Hey, like Lauren will sit on the phone and be quiet with me because she's been there. And sometimes that's all people need is your presence and just sit there and be quiet. And they know I don't mind doing that. Cause I need people to do that for me sometimes. Like, Hey, I don't, I really don't need you to say anything. Like, I just need you to just kind of be here. 
if that's cool, you know, right? And I have friends that are able to do that. And so it, it's one of those things that I really related with, with Ashley's story. And the second article, I can't remember the girl's name. I'm so sorry. But, you know, when she said that, uh, like once I read Ashley's story and then I understood what she said when the, it when they can't go coexist. And so I thought that was really, really important factor um, to to learn from. And so my perfectionism... <laughs> Oh boy. All right. We're about to get vulnerable guys. So my perfectionism, my perfectionism actually came from rejection and I didn't recognize what it was. And I didn't recognize it was perfectionism again until I went to therapy and we worked through it. Um, and what it was, was my therapist was just, I don't even know what we were talking about in the moment, but I was just talking and she's like, Hey, I, I, I want to do an exercise with you. And, um, so the exercise consisted of, um, what does she do? She created like a tree or, um, Ooh, what is that thing called? Like she put a circle and then she was like, tell me about like the first time that you felt rejection. I'm like, what are you talking about, girl? <laughs> And so like, I'm like, I don't know. And then, you know, as I started going through in my mind, um, we pinpointed that the first time that I felt rejection was when I was 11 years old. And of course, it's going to sound silly, but I'm, I'm building up to the why it makes sense now at age 33. But I was 11 years old. and I was rejected by this guy and he started dating was I friends with the girl? I don't know. He started dating this other girl. Either way, I really, really liked him and I was rejected by him. Okay. So that was like my first memory of rejection. Right. So then we're going through and she's like, okay, tell me about some other times. Tell me about a time with, you know, your parents. Tell me about a time with work. Tell me about a time with this. And like, really, we started getting into so many different things from, um, not only just dating life, but colorism, being told like, oh, you're pretty for a dark skin girl or, oh, I like light skin girls. You know what I mean? Like, um, to jobs that I didn't get because I was either overqualified, underqualified, or they just didn't say anything, um, to promotions that I didn't get that someone else might've got to colleges that I was rejected from, even though I love my GSU, whoop, but you know, um, to, um, even, um, a comment that was made to me from somebody that, oh, you know, you're a, a dark skin girl. You need to be a Delta. Light skin girls can only be AKAs, right? And that was from somebody who was super close to me. Um, and so we we really worked through that. And she's like, do you understand now why you have this perfectionism complex? She said, you have this perfectionism complex because you have always, or you you've been rejected from different areas in your life, being told you're not enough, whether that's being told you're not enough from this guy not liking you or you being, you know, your skin is too dark to do a certain thing or you're too young for this promotion or you weren't your GPA wasn't good enough to get in this school or you're overqualified for this job or insert whatever the rejection is. She's like, and so you, you've had all these areas in your life where you've been told you are not enough. And so in order for you to combat that, because you never resolved the first <laughs> the first sighting of rejection when you were 11, right? So in, in order to combat that in your mind, you created, you know what? I'm going to always be enough, okay? Whether I'm dark skin, whether I am have a master's degree, whether I have a bachelor's degree, whether I'm overweight, whether I'm insert, whatever it is, I'm always going to be enough. So I'm going to strive to this level of always being enough so you can never tell me I'm not enough, right? Woo, that was deep, guys. I'm sorry. I almost got emotional for a second. <clears throat> but yeah, like that is what, where my personality trait to perfectionism came from, because then we went back to say that, um, what did 11 year old Lauren need in that moment to know that she was enough? And I don't think I told anybody about that at the time because, you know, you're a child and you know, whatever. Right. Um, but I, th what we, we worked through is that, 11 year old Lauren at that time, if she would have been told she's enough, like it's fine, Lauren, like he can go date that girl, but you're still beautiful. You're still smart. You're still whatever. Then I could have had that moment as an 11 year old to be validated and to say, you know what? I am enough. 
Like, yeah, forget, forget him. You know what I mean? Like, but that didn't happen. And it wasn't anyone's fault but my own because I didn't say anything. Right. But I never got that validation. And so from that point forward, it was like, oh, OK, well, next time I'm going to be enough. And then when it and it would happen again and it's like, OK, well, then next time I'm going to be enough. You know what I mean? And it was always that constant level of trying to be enough. And so that is my <laughs> where my perfectionism came from. And so I want to go through some ways to kind of cope with that perfectionism and helping, because, again, that's creating a grief all within itself. Um, even in the midst of grieving, you know, I created the grief of trying to be, you know, Lauren Denise, the grief expert. And then I recognized very quickly, like you're trying to create this facade of someone who, you know, you want to be. And yes, you are someone who knows a lot about grief. Yes, you are someone who wants to help people heal. Yes, you are those things, but you also are human. So it is okay for you to be vulnerable. It's okay for you to have a bad day. It's okay for you to, you know, not know what to say when people call you about grief. It's okay to be all those things and still be able to help people, right? But again, that was something that I had to work through and understand in order for me to kind of remove or or uh, I don't want to say remove, but work through that area of grief in my life um, in order to be able to hear, be here and talk to you guys about grief in general. So, um, so I pulled some ways to cope from my therapy session as well as, um, from an article that I read about perfectionism and some ways to cope with it. So the ones from the article, I'll read those first. So the first one that they shared was to overcome negative thoughts because at the end of the day, you know, like I shared earlier in that story with Ashley is that, um, perfectionism is typically fueled by something, whether it's fear, guilt, or for me, unworthiness, right? And so if you can figure out how to overcome those negative thoughts, then that is a way for you to help, um, again, respond to those moments of perfectionism. And one thing that I really had to work through is recognizing those negative or self-defeating thoughts when they happen and actually acknowledge them. Because sometimes we do know that they're happening, right? We do recognize that these negative thoughts are coming. And so we're like, we, you know, you've heard like, okay, when you're having a negative thought, think of a positive one. Okay, well, the only way you can do that is to acknowledge that a negative one is coming, right? And even if you don't, like, you have to acknowledge like, you know what, that's a really negative thought about yourself, Lauren, that's just not like, no, like, let's not do that. Or to even just like say in this moment, like, you know what, that is a negative thought. I see you. I see you negative thought. I see what you're trying to do here. I'm going to acknowledge that you up in the building. Okay. But what I'm not going to do is give you power. OK, so let's go ahead and start and finish there. So, you know, overcoming those negative thoughts and again, recognizing when they're happening and acknowledging them and not giving them the power that they don't deserve is really, really important because at the end of the day, perfectionism is fueled by something and nine times out of 10, actually 10 times out of 10, they're negative thoughts. Um, and another thing that they said was practice mindfulness. And so basically, you know, just practicing any type of meditation or um, anything that's going to make you more self-aware, right? Because that's essentially what mindfulness is, is, is increasing your self-awareness, right? And so when those thoughts come of perfectionism, again, you know, acknowledging that they're there, acknowledging that they're coming, but not giving them the power. And it said it allows you to come to terms with your thoughts about perfectionism, making you more aware of your perfectionistic tendencies and allowing you to face these thoughts without reacting to them and responding to them and without reacting. And so I want to, I know I keep saying that, but what I mean is again, when that, that negative thought comes, if you're more mindful and you're more self-aware to say, you know what? Oh, oh, okay. A negative thought's coming. Okay. Here you come. I see you. I see you in the building, right? I'm responding to that negative thought now, as opposed to this negative thought is in my mind and I'm reacting and I'm like, shit. All right. Okay. Well, you know, I, I didn't get this job. So you know what? Next time me reacting and saying, okay, you know what? I'm gonna do this and do this, do this. Cause next time they're not going to reject me. No job is ever going to reject me again. That's me reacting instead of me responding to say, okay, like I didn't get this job. That doesn't mean you're good enough. That just means they had a different candidate. That's fine. Like, or this wasn't the job for you. Like, that's cool. Like it is what it is. That's what I mean by responding and not reacting. And when it comes again, that comes to perfectionism because that perfectionist is going to react and say, you know what? Never again, am I going to be rejected from any job? You're never going to tell me I'm not good enough. So I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to make sure you all never 
never reject me again or i'm gonna go back and buy the building just because y'all rejected me which again not a problem hey buy the block back however that is what a perfectionist would do instead of recognizing what's happening and just responding and say you know what that's cool like that job won for me i ain't setting y'all thank you though <laughs> look thanks but no thanks to you okay and this actually teaches you to release stress associated with that perfectionism. Because again, perfectionism can cause a lot of anxiety. It can cause people to have panic attacks and it can cause you to do a lot of things. And for me, uh, one of my, um, well, my thing that happens with perfectionism is my reaction to perfectionism. And it's going to sound crazy, but it's the truth is binge eating. So when I feel that perfectionism happening, which again, the root is rejection. So when I feel rejected, I binge eat in order for me to, um, it's, it's like a comfort, right? It's just like when people self harm or, you know, any of that. So it's like, I feel bad. If I feel bad in that moment or I feel rejected, I'm just going to go eat. I'm going to eat whatever I want. I will face a pizza. I will do whatever I want to do because now I feel bad because my stomach is hurting. And so now I'm not even thinking about whatever the actual, you know, rejection was, or really it wasn't even a rejection. I, I, um, perceived it as a, as a rejection. Right. And so what I do is I go and binge eat and that's my way of comforting that instead of acknowledging what's really happening, but I'll get into that in a second. So, um, yeah, so being mindful of that and being aware of that actually helps you reduce, um, that stress and, um, which was the next one that the article said was reduce stress. So um, for me, that just means release any person, place or thing that is adding stress to your life. So if there are people adding stress to your life. You got to go. Peace out. Because what I'm not going to do is add unnecessary stress. Not when I get to choose the stress. Are you crazy? Like if you are a person who is constantly bringing stress to my life, and you think I'm about to talk to you? Oh, the answer is no. <laughs> like You're not about to stress me out for fun. Are you crazy? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And if there is a place, again, I'm no, absolutely not. I know you're probably like, well, Laura, my job stresses me out. Listen, get an exit plan and leave, okay? Because I am a number one proponent about mental health and what no job, no person, no place or thing is going to put stress on me just because y'all feel like it. Absolutely not. Because if something happens to me, guarantee you going to move forward with your life and the world is going to continue to spin whether I'm here or not. So absolutely not. And with that being said, when you do release those things, add positive things to your life that are going to, you know, bring you stress free. So I recognize when I exercise a lot, obviously it releases, what is it? Is it endorphins or serotonin? I can't remember. I'm not, a, you know, if you listen and tell me, if you, if you listen send me a DM and tell me what it is, but basically it releases something in your mind that makes you happy. And so, um, you know, I recognize like, you know, I'm less stressed when I'm working out because obviously it's releasing this happy, happy feeling in my brain and I feel good. I look good. You know what I mean? And so doing things like that is what I mean. Um, so these are the ones that I pulled from my therapy session, um, with that particular session. And so um, another way to cope with it is actually find the root. So again, like my therapist did, she created some type of tree or, you know, um, web thing and we worked through what it is. So this may be, um, this may be hard on your own to do because again, I didn't recognize what it was. And then when we were talking, she was kind of like, huh, let's do an exercise. And then we just started going through um, to understand why I got to that level right? Um, so for you, it may be fear. Again, it may be unworthiness. It may be guilt, like find whatever that root is and then pinpoint what it, it like where it started. And then that is, is kind of where you start because once we pinpoint it, it started for me at 11 and that it never got resolved. Then I understood at that moment that, oh, okay. So when you're going through this moment of having rejection, that's not 33 year old Lauren, that's 11 year old Lauren. And she never got that resolved. And so in those moments that you're feeling rejected or you're feeling whatever, instead of you acknowledging and recognizing that's not even what's really happening right now, that 11 year old Lauren who never got it resolved is taking over. And so now she's going to go eat because that's, what's going to make her feel good. She's going to go, you know, do whatever. Cause that's, what's going to make her feel good as opposed to acknowledging like, Oh, 
okay, you're feeling rejected in this moment. 11 year old Lauren, what do you need? What's up, boo? What validation do you need? You know what I mean? And I know that sounds crazy. And I know people are like, what you be talking to? Yes, you have to acknowledge and pinpoint whatever it is. And for you, it may not even be that young. It may be two years ago. It may be, you know, whatever it is. Right. But like pinpoint and really find the root of what it is. Um, and so again, in those moments, like once I found out what the root was, now I can acknowledge and overcome those negative thoughts. Cause I can say, Oh, okay. This is not you. Like, cause you know, good and well, like it's not anything about the job. It's, it's about this feeling of rejection and it's 11 year old Lauren. Cause she never got a resolve. She never got that validation she needed, whether it was from a guy, whether it was from her family, whether it was from friends that she was enough. And so right now you're feeling like you're not enough because you didn't get this job or you didn't get into this school or, uh, you know, whatever insert rejection. Right. And so instead of, instead of you, uh, you know, going to eat this pizza, let's go ahead and talk to little Lauren and see what she needs in this moment. Um, and so when you do that, like once you find the root and once you understand that identify what is truth when thoughts of perfectionism happen. So again, um, I'll just keep saying the job because that's just the easiest one for me to say. Like I didn't get the job. Right. And I'm like, oh, I'm not good enough. So, you know, I'm instead of me not being good enough, I'm just going to go ahead because, again, perfection of you're trying to reach this level that's never going to happen. So instead of me saying, you know what, I'm not good enough. And you know what, next time I'm going to do X, Y and Z. I can say, you know what, that's not true. You are good enough. This job just wasn't for you. It's OK. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Like just go ahead and apply for the next one. Like, it's cool. Like it is what it is. <laughs> like, you know, there's thousands of people, hundreds of thousands at this point, you know, looking for jobs out here with all different levels of education and skills and people who they know, like it's cool, boo. It's fine. Right. But you know, you have to identify what is truth when those thoughts of perfectionism happen. And so for me, something that uh, my therapist and I talked about is when I have those moments is to acknowledge a uh, little Lauren, as I call her, and, you know, go to the ultimate truth maker, God. <laughs> okay. He's the ultimate validator. He's the ultimate one who's going to tell you the truth. Right. And he's never going to be like, you're garbage. Right. And so in those moments, I'm like, God, help me. Like what is going on? And he always does bring me back. So go to God, go to you know, universe, creator, whatever it is that you choose to acknowledge and get that ultimate truth to know that when you're having those moments, like, listen, if you need some validation, that one there is the ultimate validator. Right. Um, and so that is what worked for me. Um, and so another thing that you can do is in those moments of perfectionism, when you're starting to kind of get in those moments of like, oh my God, I failed or I didn't do, you know, whatever. So again, this is my experience because I, have or my root is from rejection so I had to make a note about things that make me feel great and things that make me feel wanted right because obviously rejection is not feeling wanted so I had to make a list of things that um made me feel wanted whether it was like when my friends say you're a good friend or you know whatever whatever it is that it is like so when I'm feeling those moments of feeling rejected I can go and say OK, you are wanted, Lauren, like just in this moment, just because it didn't happen. That's cool. But you are wanted. And here's some some instances when you are wanted all the time. Right. And so that can bring me back. Or uh, she told me to make a playlist. So I have my I call it my feel good playlist songs that like make me just feel good, make me want to dance, make me feel sexy, make me feel wanted, make me feel excited. You know what I mean? Whatever it is, like bringing me out of those moments. And a way that's, again, a way to almost overcome those negative thoughts that are happening. So instead of like, okay, like, all right, talking to yourself, like, cool, like, go ahead and look at that list, play your music and bring you back out of it. And something that somebody wrote in an article, um, was she that article about um, grief and perfectionism can't coexist. She says she wrote down all of the things that didn't make her perfect. And that actually helped her in those moments to say, you know what, these things are normal. Like I like to sleep late. I don't like to get up early. Like that's cool. You know what I mean? Like, and so if that works for you, then I would definitely try that out as well. But you just need things that are going to ground you in those moments when you have those feelings of perfectionism and they're bringing you to those moments. Like, dang it. Like 
I'm not good enough. I'm failing again, or I'm not being the perfect griever. You know what I mean? So it, it just grounds you and brings you back. And then the last thing that I learned in my therapy, which I love is recognize those moments and give yourself grace. If you allow that moment to win. And what I mean about that is for me, again, my uh, thing to do when I feel those moments of rejection or that perfectionism happening is I binge eat. Right. And so sometimes like I, I don't catch myself or I don't acknowledge it or whatever. Right. Cause again, this is something that I'm working through that I've had my, you know, at this point, 22 years of my life. And so it's, it's a process that I have to work through just like any type of grief. It's something you have to work through. And so in those moments that um, I allowed that to win, like when I did binge eat, I apologized to not only myself, but I apologized to 11 year old little Lauren to say, you know what? I'm so sorry I didn't give you the validation that you needed in that moment. And I chose to, um, you know, do this thing that's going to make you feel bad later, but make you forget the thing, the actual thing you needed validation from. I'm so sorry, but I'm going to give you grace to know that you are working through it and you are doing great. Right. And so, you know, in those moments when you're having those moments of perfectionism and you feel like you're a failure and, you know, you go and binge eat or you go and throw up your food or you go and lay in the bed all day to give yourself grace, say, you know what, like you let that moment win, you let that moment of perfectionism creep in there. You didn't reach it. And so now, you know, you're feeling bad, but now you're feeling bad. You're not thinking about that thing anymore. You let, now you've let something else, like you put it in place of that, but you know what? I'm giving you grace, Lauren, I'm, or insert name. I'm giving you grace to say, it's okay. Like it, it happens sometimes, you know, you're working through it. You recognize that's what it was. Right. And you work through that. And that happened to me, you know, about a month ago, I had a moment of rejection from a friend and I didn't recognize like what was happening at the time. Like I just felt really unmotivated and I just didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to work out. I didn't want to do anything with the podcast. I didn't want to do anything. I was like, why am I so unmotivated? Like I didn't have a bad day. I slept well. It was very weird. I was just very, very unmotivated about everything. And I faced a pizza, right? Like when I say face the pizza, I mean, I ate the whole thing. So like I ate the whole thing. And then immediately after I ate it, I said, oh, okay, you're having a moment of rejection. What's going on? What, 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 what's happening? And I recognized that in that moment. And I apologized to myself and, and, and little Lauren about what it was that I was feeling rejection about and choosing food instead of acknowledging, um, what was happening in that moment. But I gave myself grace to say, you know what, like, Shout out to you for acknowledging, for recognizing that's what it was. And shout out to you for acknowledging that and working through that. So now you can say, oh, that's what it was. Okay, well, that's not what it is. Like, you're not rejected by this person. That's just who they are. And that's okay. And this is who you are. And you're a great friend. And you're all of these things, right? Um, So, you know, just giving yourself grace to that. You know, I say that all the time anyway on the show is to be kind to yourself and give yourself grace. And that's really what you have to do when it comes to perfectionism. So I know this is pretty long. I know. I know. Sorry, guys. I know it was pretty long, but I just wanted to really share that because, again, it's it's something that I personally work through on a daily basis. I think a lot of people, you know, have it and they don't even recognize the personality trait because they're just like, no, like. I'm just, you know, what my friends call me bougie. Like, you know, like, no, I just have high standards. Well, yeah, sometimes your high standards are perfectionism and that's okay too. Right. But it's recognizing what it is and getting to the root of why you're like that is what is, is the beauty of it and what's going to make it such a beautiful journey at the end. But you know, I wanted to just be honest and transparent. I think this is the most honest and vulnerable I've been with my journey. So thank you guys for, uh, you know, listening to my journey. So let me know, um, you know, on social media, if you have had the same, you know, journey with perfectionism, or if you have had any issues with perfectionism yourself, I would love, love, love to hear it. But, you know, as I always say, guys, as you are going through this journey and learning yourself and learning, if you do have perfectionism, if you do how to work through it again, as I always say, my favorite phrase, be kind to yourself and give yourself grace, because if you don't, who will? Thank you so much, guys, for listening to another week's episode. If you haven't already, follow me on social media at TTSS Pod for updates, exciting information. Send me any DMs about the show. I'm super excited and always love to hear from you guys. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to rate, review, 
follow and share with your family and friends. If you want to know more about me, your girl, Lauren Denise, check out my website at this two shall suck podcast.com and feel free to send me any questions or topics you want to hear at hello at this two shall suck podcast.com. The episode was produced by Mike Sick and our original music is produced by Jimmy Samaj. As always, I love you guys. I'm sending you love and light in your life because you deserve it. I'll see you on the next episode. Mwah.